We're in the second Sunday in the season of Lent. And while I won't be with you this Sunday, I wanted to offer uh, a sermon from one of the resurrection texts. The resurrection text for Simon Peter. And instead of reading the text and then preaching, what I want to do is translate the text as we go into it. And I'll begin with John chapter 21. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John, and two other disciples are together. And Simon says to them, I'm returning to fishing. Now, this returning to fishing is really a statement of resignation. Simon Peter was so disappointed in his failure, his three times denying Jesus and the third time cursing the name of Jesus, that he quits. Have you ever failed so miserably that you just want to crawl in a hole or, or quit? Ever been so frustrated at work you just want to walk away? The text here is a return to his old profession. And his friends say, we'll go with you. I think I think the darkness of this moment, it's at night. And for John, the play on light and darkness indicates what's going on in the story. Uh, these men have lost a great deal in the loss of Jesus, their teacher, their mentor, their best friend. They're in a deep darkness emotionally and spiritually, and they're searching in the darkness. And they go back to what they know, fishing. We all know that experience when we need to go back to the, the thing we know. And so they go out on the boat that night and they catch nothing. I want you to feel the weight of professional fishermen fishing all night, exhausted, and the frustration of catching nothing. And it's interesting how John writes this passage. It's just powerful. Just at daybreak, as the light of the rising sun, there stands the risen Son of God, Jesus, on the beach. I mean, it couldn't be any more obvious. The contrast between the darkness of the disciples, their frustration, their emptiness of their nets, pointing to the emptiness inside them, and Peter's vast emptiness, personal disappointment, frustration, and anger at himself. And in contrast, there in the light, the light of the risen sun stands on the beach. And in their utter darkness and their utter despair and their utter frustration, they cannot see it's Jesus. Have you ever been so frustrated, so angry, so distraught, you can't see the forest for the trees. And Jesus calls out and says, children, that word of kinship again. In spite of their feeling exiled, probably by their own guilt, their own anger, their own frustrations, Jesus has none of that. Children, you have no fish, have you? Can you, can you imagine the frustration of having to admit no, we don't. And Jesus says, cast your nets to the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now for those of us who've read the other gospel accounts, in the back of our minds we're going, hey, we've seen this story play out before. This is the call story. Peter is back where he began. Have you had an experience in your life knock you on your heels, knock you back to the beginning, a failure that just literally set you back to the beginning? Peter finds himself three years later back at go. 
That's a disastrous failure. And so, out of frustration or maybe just desperation, they throw their nets on the other side. and Suddenly, they're not able to haul the catch in. And of course, the memory kicks in. And Peter says, it's the Lord. And Peter being Peter, he's naked because part of that job as a fisherman back then is you have to be able to jump into the water to um, untangle the nets. He puts on his clothes and he jumps in the water. He leaves his brothers and his fellow fishermen to deal with this great catch. He's swimming to Jesus. Impetuous. Thinks after he acts, that's Peter. But they're not too far off from shore. And there on the shore, Jesus has set a charcoal fire. Can you, feel, can you just smell the, the fish broiling? Hear it sizzling. And the bread baking and the smell of the fresh bread. Well, this takes us back to John chapter 6, where Jesus takes just a little bread and fish and provides for a multitude. Jesus is going to provide again with fish and bread. And in chapter 6, we see this fish and bread as the groundwork for Jesus' sacramental conversation about his body being the food of of our existence. This is a last supper, though it's not wine and bread, it's fish and bread. It's an abundance. Peter is on empty, and so are these disciples, and Jesus is going to give them an abundance, and he invites them to bring some of their fish, the fish that he's provided, to the fire. You know, this is such an amazing catch of large fish that they count. And the count is an odd number. It's a number they'll always remember, 153. Not about 100, not about 200, but exactly 153. And they come and have breakfast. Probably the quietest breakfast ever. No one says anything because they know who it is. And What do you say to the person you ran out on? To the person you abandoned in their greatest moment of need, in their most vulnerable moment? You ran away. You denied him. What's important for John to tell us here is this is the third time Jesus has appeared to the disciples. Three times. Three times is important. It's perfection. This is the perfect appearance. This is the complete appearance. This is, this is the one that, that needs to happen for the disciples to get it. How many times does it take us sometimes to get the message? So they've had their fill of breakfast. And the awkward silence is still a little squirmy. And Jesus breaks the silence with the gentleness of his very direct voice. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Jesus uses the word, and the Greek that John uses is agape. That form of love that is amazingly powerful and strong. The kind of love we use for God's love for us. Imagine being Peter asking, do you love me? More than these, the nets, the fish, the boats the business, the brothers you fish with. Do you love me more than these? And Peter has to look back at his denials 
the many times his mouth moved before his brain was in gear when God had to tell him a transfiguration, be quiet and listen. I imagine Peter halted and wet his lips. And, and this is what he said. John uses the word from brotherly love, philia, from which we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Yes, Lord, you know that, that I am your friend. I love you like a friend. He couldn't say I love you with everything because he didn't. Without hesitation, Jesus said, feed my lambs. Imagine that. Peter couldn't admit that he loved Jesus in the very way that Jesus asked him. I love you in a different way. And Jesus trusted him with his lambs. I don't know how long it was between the first question and the second. But try to imagine what was going through Peter's mind and through the mind of the other disciples that were watching and knew what was going on and they too were weighing their own failures. And the second time Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me? Wow. He asked me twice. What must have been going through Peter's mind and heart at that time? I can't tell him I love him that way because I didn't. I failed him. Yes, Lord, you know I am your friend. I love you like a friend. Without hesitation in that voice that only Jesus can speak in, he says, tend my sheep, care for my sheep. Can you imagine what's going through Peter and the disciples' minds? Two times now Jesus asked this question, and two times now Jesus has told Peter, feed and tend and care for my sheep. How could you trust me to do this when I've failed you so utterly? Three times, three times, I denied you. I'm not worthy of your trust. And Jesus said to them the third time, and Jesus changes the question. It doesn't come over in English because we only have one for word for love. I love ice cream. I love my grandchildren. I love my dog. I love my wife. I love my town. It's all the same word. But it's not the same love. The third time Jesus says, Simon, son of John, are you my friend? Do you love me like a friend? Philia. Oh, and Peter felt deeply hurt because this third time he asked, do you love me like a friend? Jesus met Peter where he was. Peter couldn't hide anymore. He couldn't hide behind the truth that he didn't love him, agape. He couldn't hide behind the truth that he was a friend. Because Jesus met him where he was. Three sins. Three denials. And three forgivenesses. And the third time... Peter couldn't let his guilt, his shame, his self-deprecation, his beating himself up be the excuse for resigning, for quitting, for returning to fishing. No. Peter said the truth. Lord, you know everything. What he says, I can't hide anything from you. And the truth is we, we can't hide anything from Jesus. Jesus knows our worst mistake, our deepest regret, that thing we wish we could go back and relive and fix it and get it right. 
and all the praying and all the wishing and all the regretting won't change it. And you know that I love you like a friend. And Jesus said one more time, feed my sheep. With that realization and those three forgivenesses, Peter couldn't hide anymore. Not behind shame, not behind regret, not behind beating himself up because Jesus wasn't willing to beat him up. Jesus wasn't willing to shame him. Jesus wasn't willing to take his worst moment and count it against him. For the steadfast love and mercy of the Lord endures forever. The forgiveness of God is undescribable. And then after telling Peter that the future would be one he couldn't understand, but it would be one he would not be alone in, he said these two words, follow. That's where Jesus comes to us today to offer us a resurrection appearance. Follow me. Regardless of what the past might look like, regardless of what regret or shame or mistake or thing we think keeps God from calling us, keeps God from using us, you, you could not have done anything more regrettable than Peter. And if he were standing here today, he could tell you in his own voice, no one could have disappointed God, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit any more than he did. St. Paul would have said to you, if he's standing here right now, there's no greater sinner on earth than St. Paul who absolutely persecuted the church. And so, with these confessions, know this. Jesus comes to us today in our darkness, in our emptiness, in whatever way we feel inadequate, broken, shamed, regretted, or incapable to say, I accept you where you are but I refuse to leave you as I found you. Probably one of the greatest things Max Lucado ever said was that summary of Jesus' mercy. And so Jesus comes to you today and say, tend my sheep, feed my lambs, follow me. Accept God's complete forgiveness. Accept Jesus' complete trust that you have a place in the kingdom. And let all that regret, all that worry, all that shame, all that failure just fall off you like grain off a duck's back. Spread your wings. And trust Jesus and fly. Fly toward your calling. Feed God's lambs. Tend God's sheep. And follow Jesus and experience the power of resurrection like you've never experienced it before. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Live in this peace and this hope, my friends.